Do you dream of making quality content for a game that you love? Does every video tutorial you try and watch look like it was recorded in 2007 by Hypercam 2? Do you wish there was a British guy living in his mother's basement with absolutely no measurable experience to pretend to teach you with some sort of vague authority on the subject? Well, you're in luck, because I'm making a series about it. Welcome to uh, this, this kind of different series for me to do in particular. Um, not a huge amount of experience with this type of thing, but I do want to point out before we really get on with it that I am by no means an expert. There are going to be a lot of much more talented, knowledgeable people out there who would be much better at doing this than me. Primarily the reason I want to do this series is because as I'm personally making mods, I'm finding it very difficult to, to find the information I need that is up to date and sort of centralized in an area and I'm hoping by making it into a video series so that you guys... Uh, can follow along and, and not have so many issues as what I'm having. You know, it, it, there's information hidden across forums, across Reddit, in, in just the weird parts of the internet. So I figured if we centralize it here, it's going to make it easier for everybody. So this is sort of the, the introductory episode, the sort of um, very beginning of beginning. So before you get started on any sort of uh, modding or content production, this is the sort of thing that you'll need to go over. So we're going to talk about the programs that we are going to use for making mods. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the file structure of, of mods and what you'd sort of expect to see in different areas of mods. So if you've never even looked at a CK2 mod before, hopefully you can understand a little bit of how it's just laid out uh, before, you know, really getting into building one. Because I figured that helps out quite a lot. And then we'll also go over the .mod file, which isn't actually part of the CK2 mod, but, but interacts with your CK2 launcher and basically tells the game what your mod is. So we'll look at that one as well. But like I said, first things first, we'll start off with what you'll actually need. So on my desktop here are a handy set of uh, tools. Basically, you'll probably want all of these. Um, I'll discuss certain ones as we go on here. But all these tools, besides Photoshop at the very top there, are free to download, free to use. I will put a link to all of them in the description, obviously besides Paint, which comes with Windows. But I'll explain why that one there is there in a minute. So we'll start from the top and work our way down. First things first, Adobe Photoshop is incredibly useful for making any sort of graphics for your mod. That can be anything from something as simple as a religion icon to something a lot more complex like event pictures to interfaces, anything like that. You can use Photoshop for the production of that. Now, if you're using a tool like Photoshop, uh, you will also need a tool, well, you'll need paint.net as well. Particularly because the type of files ga uh, Crusader Kings uses for its images aren't generally produced by Photoshop. So one that you'll see a lot, just as an example, in, in CK2 is a .dds file, um, sort of a classic game engine image file that you don't generally produce with Photoshop. So you can make your images in Photoshop, open them up in Paint.net, and then resave them as the Paint.net with all the correct settings. If you don't have access to Photoshop, I'm lucky enough to have an education copy. Um, but for those of you who don't have that, there is another program called GIMP. Uh, graphical Image Manipulation Program, I think it's called. Um, so you can go ahead and download that one. Very, very similar to Photoshop. Sort of a little bit more clunky, but obviously it is a free-to-use um, and, and, well, no no license or anything like that. It's free to download, free to use program. So uh, it does come with some drawbacks, but again, it is a very, very powerful tool for those of you who don't have Photoshop. Paint.net, you will need no matter what. Even if you have Photoshop, even if you have GIMP already, I would recommend Paint.net as well. You could, in theory, do everything you wanted with Paint.net. I personally find Paint.net kind of a pain in the ass to use for actually making images just because it's UI and because of certain systems are... Um, Again, just a little bit clunky compared to something like Photoshop or GIMP. So Paint.net is really, really good because it can produce the image files needed for the game engine to be able to um, sort of read and understand what they are. Unfortunately, you can't just drop a JPEG or a PNG into it 9 times out of 10. You will need to produce specific images, but I will talk about that in a future video dedicated to making those. So Paint.net is something you will definitely need for those as well. And then finally... Who can go wrong with classic Microsoft Paint? Honestly, if you need to change an image type, if you need to resize an image, there is nothing easier than Paint. It opens up in about two seconds rather than Photoshop, which takes a long time to initialize. Same with GIMP and Paint.net. They take a while to open. If you just want to convert, you know, a PNG to a JPEG, open it up in Paint, resave it, instant. Uh, if you want to make an image bigger, just open it up in Paint, change the size by 150%, save it. Problem solved. Genuinely can't go wrong with this. Would highly recommend it. Then, for actually making your mods for the actual um, scripting aspect of things, you're going to use Notepad++, or at least I would recommend heavily Notepad++. 
sort of like your regular notepad, but a bit more complex. It has a lot more uh, development tools built in. Again, completely free to use. We'll be looking at this in a second in a bit more detail. If you've never heard of Notepad++, I highly recommend it just to download it for um, regular tasks. Even if you're just a sort of casual gamer, uh, editing settings, files, anything like that is much, much easier with Notepad++. So I highly recommend it. Finally, you can use any sort of zip file manager for uploading your mod. For You don't particularly need it for Steam Workshop, but if you want to upload it 20 hours, ModDB, your own personal thing, Reddit, wherever. Um, I would recommend 7-Zip. You don't have to use 7-Zip, you can use WinZip as well, but 7-Zip is entirely free. And honestly, I've, I've had a lot of issues with WinZip that I haven't had with 7-Zip. It tends to be a lot more of a responsive program, so I definitely recommend this one. Again, these are all free to use and free to download, and 100% endorsed and recommended by, by myself. Um, so, with that said and done, if you've got all these programs, you are basically good to go. That's genuinely everything you'll need, uh, besides a copy of Crusader Kings, obviously. So we'll talk about just the general file structure of a mod. This isn't going to get particularly complicated. I'm just going to show you what files go where and what certain folders, um, uh, files in particular folders you'll need to edit to get certain gameplay effects, if that makes sense. So this is your standard CK2 mod folder. This just happens to be the CK2 mod folder that we're using for the Game of Thrones series up on the main channel. Um, or this is going on the main channel, so up on this channel, I guess. So we'll dive into the Game of Thrones mod folder. So before we do that, I would just mention very briefly, if you download things from the Steam Workshop, they will always come as .zip files. If you download certain other external ones, they can come in folders. It makes absolutely no difference in terms of the mod. You would just have to edit the .mod folder, but we'll leave that for the end. Uh, like I said, files, uh, folders or zip files makes absolutely no difference. So this is your typical Crusader Kings mod directory. Um, this is where all of your files will go. So starting with folder one here, we have the common folder, and this is basically just all the information for your mod. Um, it can come in various types, so you've got your cultures in here, you have your religions in here, which is going to be one of the first example mods we build, a sort of culture and religion mod. Uh, you have troop types, societies, you have trade routes, you have all just your generic CK2 information, and that's sort of the main point of the common folder. Um, there are some more complicated stuff, like scripting stuff, we won't touch that for quite some time yet. Decisions, um, again, just all of your right-click decisions, all of your intrigue menu decisions you can find in this folder here. And again, everything in these folders will be text documents unless you're looking at something like GFX, which will be your images. Events are, funnily enough, in-game events, things that occur during your campaign as you're playing to help things, uh, help things along a little bit. As you can see, I've most recently edited the pirate events here to add some new stuff to that. In the GFX folder, this is where all of your in-game images will be stored. So if you go to the traits folder, these will be all the images for the traits in the Game of Thrones. Once you see here, we've got like green sight, grayscale, that type of thing. If we go to characters, you can see all the faces for the in-game characters here. Well, at least you would if I picked a culture that we could actually try and make out. Uh, let's go with like Bone Mountain. Oh no, we still can't see them. They're, they're too soon now. But you'll have to take my word on that. That's where all the character faces are stored. If you've got your ambitions, you've got your coat of arms. All that very basic stuff. And again, like I, like I said before, these are generally saved as .dds files or .tga files. So something like Photoshop won't be compatible with these. You will have to use paint.net, hence why I've recommended that one. We've got, outside of this one, history. History is the information that will be applied to the map. So you have your starting characters in particular bookmarks. So if we go with Game of Thrones, you've got uh, George Martin here, very basic character. Um, and it, again, these will what will spawn in depending on the bookmark you pick at the start of the game. Provinces, and of course they can change as the game goes on depending on the year. So these will be all your base game provinces. We have, I don't know, the Isle of Faces. And this just tells the game what this province has in it. So it's a half self run culture who worship the old gods, for example. You've got technology. Whoops. You've got technology, which isn't relevant in Game of Thrones mode. You've got your base game titles as well. And then you've got uh, historical wars. So, you know, X versus Y, Kagosi Rebellion, that type of thing. Again, just so if you look through the history of the game, these things are present. And it's good for setting up um, scenarios at the start of your campaign. Interface is, as it sounds, it's your interface. So these are not your image files, but this tells the game how to use the image files that you've given it. So, say, let's, for example, I, I'm sure I've edited one recently. Um, probably the religiousreformation.gfx. Yeah. Um, if we open this up, this tells the game how to use, like I said, your particular images. So, when you're making uh, some sort of 
I don't know, religious interface mod. I picked a really bad example here. But you can tell it to use reformation left bg.dds for this particular thing here, and then you call that during the code. You can't directly call images. You have to define it in the sprite types. So it knows basically how big the image is, what type of image it is, how to apply it to the game, that type of thing. Just instructions on how to use the images you've given it. Localization is um, essentially the descriptions for events, for characters in all of its various different languages. So if we've opened one I've edited recently, so gogosossi.csv is the one I've been building. Might be some spoilers in here, so don't read too hard if you're waiting for the series. So say, for example, when I've made new buildings, uh, I've added a building called gogosossi underscore slave underscore market. But you want that to appear in the game, not as gogosossi underscore slave market, but in fact as small gogosossi slave pens. And the localization is where you will tell the game what this, uh, essentially what this scripting actually should be displayed as to the player. Player. Very straightforward to edit that as well. It's just a case of, um, you know, finding what you've actually called it in the code uh, and then giving it a proper equivalent in, in English or you, it supports multiple other languages as well. Obviously, I'm only doing English because I speak English. Map is map. Very straightforward. Um, so where all your map files are going to go. One of the more complicated things to edit, but say, for example, we open terrain.bmp, you can see the terrain of the Game of Thrones map here. Um, there you go, you see Valyria there, all horribly burnt, shy, all dark and spooky. These are the literal map files, not the characters, not the provinces, but just the shape and the geography of your mod. Much more complicated to do, though. We might touch that on the, on the future, because I've only made a couple of map mods, so again, I'm not much of an expert on that one. Music and sound should be very straightforward. Music is the actual soundtrack going on in the background, you know, the one you can skip in the, uh, the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, your BGM, basically. And then in sound are going to be your, your actual sounds. This is using the uh, base game sounds for the most part, except for letterevent.wav, which is a custom one they've added. This would be your death sounds, you know, uh, money entering the treasury, making the sort of tinkly coin sound. That's where you put those, if you had any. That's your basic mod structure. It's really not as complicated as it looks, and hopefully it doesn't look that complicated to you guys anyway. If, if you're thinking, oh my god, this is, this is crazy. It's incredibly self-explanatory. And eventually you would just learn more or less where things go and where they should equate to in the uh, in the mod structure here. And then the final thing I wanted to touch on very briefly is the actual .mod file itself. So these can come in two different flavors. You've got the .mod file for folders, or you've got the .mod file for zip archives. And there's a very small difference here. So if you go ahead and open up the Game of Thrones one, Probably a bad example because they are replacing a lot of the base game assets if you're making a very small mod. Obviously, you won't touch this. But I'll break it down line by line here. So the mod folder basically tells the game what the mod is. So from the start, its name is a Game of Thrones. Understandably, the path. So this is where the mod files are stored is mod slash a Game of Thrones. One of the biggest differences between this and a zip archive, if we open up the artifact acquisition uh, mod here, the, it will say archive equals aaos.zip rather than path equals Game of Thrones. You will have a path if you have a folder, and then obviously if it's a .zip, it will be an archive. Anything you download from the, game, from the workshop will be an archive. So not only that, you have user directory. So this is um, basically where the save games will go, right? So if we go back a folder here... The user directory equates to this folder here, as you can see. And in here will be all your save games, the map files, the sort of initialization stuff, screenshots as well, apparently, which I didn't know they went there. Um, but that will be what that means. So if you want your mod to have a very specific save game, if, say, for example, you make a mod that's not compatible with uh, a save game that already exists, you might want to add a different user directory so that people don't accidentally load a save game and have everything broken. Supported checksums. Used generally in major total conversion mods uh, like CK2 plus HIP and a Game of Thrones as well. If you're making a small little add-on mod, not going to be relevant. But this tells you what the checksum of your mod should be. And then they can show, you know, a screen saying, hey, your checksum's wrong. You might want to check that the mod's downloaded right because something's fucked up here. And then you've also got a, a picture file for your little Steam icon or whatever. And that is essentially that. This is all, like I said, replacing base game stuff. Because in the Game of Thrones, you don't necessarily want Charlemagne spawning. So you do want to replace... Um, you know, certain particular things, you might want to replace, you know, like the religions there, replacing the Game of Thrones religions instead of having things like Christianity in the Game of Thrones world, which I think would be an absolute mess. So that is the essential mod structure. That's your mod file as well, and how they sort of interact with one another. Again, if this sounds overwhelming, it's really, really not. It's it's much more straightforward than it would look, and I'm, again, I'm no expert here. I probably haven't explained this exceptionally well, but hopefully... That's a little window into how things work over here and the tools that you will need as well for producing your mod. If you've got any questions, leave me a comment and I will answer it. If there's anything wrong with this video, let me know and I will make amends and corrections accordingly. 
Um, and if you've got any hints, of course, if you are a mod maker, if you have experience with this type of thing, uh, and you want to help people out, take a look. Uh, leave some comments pointing out where the hell I went wrong and why I'm a terrible person and all that type of thing. And hopefully, guys, uh, enjoy this series. So what I'm probably going to start with next episode is taking a look into basic culture and religion modding. Should be very, very easy. If you think it sounds daunting, it's, like I said, it's really, really not. Um, we'll go over that next episode. If you guys have any suggestions for future episodes, of course, let me know as well. And uh, we will take a look at that in the future. And of course, these series would not be possible without the patrons of which the channel would have burnt a long time ago, horribly, in a fire. Or at least, that's that's what I'm pretty sure would have happened. A big shout out to Big Dick Timmy, Tom Terrier 18, Zachary Harris, Arik, Lucas Holting, Sean Thornton, Loris, Haydog, Sadini, Necrophilin, Asuna Kirito for Kundo Vasquez, I'm the Lizard King, Josh Lindin, Tesla, Michael Mullen, Tyler Birch, Powers Presley, Logan Thorne, Conspire T, Orcs Wolf, Average Gamer 419, Escape, and Jackson Women. For this part on Patreon, congratulations, you've all funded education. You're good people. Well done for, for helping um, society. That's what you've done here today. It's essentially a charitable, char charitable donation to society. Um, we do live in one of those. And as well, a big shout out to Nathaniel Lindbergh, Euphrates, Jimmy, Quasar Fox, Jack Allen, Gabriel Vanders, Luana Thomas, Nathan Flores, Yuron DeVries, Don Cong 217, Zet McDougall, Joseph Beard, Jordan Campbell, Harry McGowan, Will Wade, Chris, Circle the Swede, The Sage, Asro, Nick, Fraser, Brennan, Kevin Saunders, Betamus Max, The Insane Pickle, Adam Person, Igor Kozak, Haji Dumar, Noah Gallimore, Panther Pearl, and Alpha Scuff, thank you all for supporting the education of the masses. Or, if you don't like supporting education, let's just pretend, I, I don't know, I spent the Patreon money on Magic the Gathering cards? I don't, you know, fuck education.